Hi everyone, this is Dr. Diana Song Song and today we will discuss your Science 2 module, the human body. The human body is a complex structure composed of cells, tissues, organs, and body systems that all work together for your um, for your body to function properly. In this video lesson, we will talk about this topics more in detail. In this video, I'd like to talk about levels of organization. In many multicellular organisms, cells work together to create tissues. Tissues create organs, organs create organ systems, and organ systems create organisms. Multicellular organisms like mammals or amphibians have different types of cells like nerve cells or skin cells. When these similar cells work together, they create tissues. Today we are going to learn about the skeletal system. We are going to look at what it is, how many bones do we have in our body, and what are the functions of the skeletal system. Let's start off with what is the skeletal system. The skeletal system is comprised of bones and joints. The bones provide the majority of strength, support, and help in a variety of bodily functions as you'll discover later in the video. The joints. There are around 100 joints in the human skeleton, which enable the skeleton to move through multiple ranges of movement. Just think, without these joints, we would be statues, unable to move. An example of a joint is your elbow joint, which is where your humerus connects to your ulna and radius bones in your forearm. How many bones do we have? The typical human has 206 bones in their body. However, this isn't always the case. At birth, you are born with 300 bones. I know you're probably thinking, how do we lose bones? Where are these bones going? Well, when you're born, there is many bones such as a skull that haven't fully developed yet. This delayed fusion allows your brain to grow until the bones fuse at around two years of age. Skeletal system functions. There are four main functions of the skeletal system which help the body in their own unique ways. Protection. The skeleton protects our delicate organs, preventing them from undergoing any harm. Some examples of these are the skull, which protects the brain, rib cage, which protects the heart and lungs, and finally the spinal column, which protects the spinal cord. Shape and support. The skeleton is the body's framework, holding our vital organs in place, not allowing them to move freely around our body. Without the skeleton, we would not have a posture and therefore look like a big blob, making movement really hard. Which leads into the next function, movement. Bones are the attachment sites for muscles. Without the muscles attaching to the bones, we would be unable to move. When you look at your arm, for example, muscles such as biceps and triceps are the reason your forearm is able to flex and extend. Also, we talked about before joints, which allow the bones a wide range of movement and without joints, the shoulder or hip wouldn't be able to move as freely as it does. Blood production. Red and white blood cells are produced in the bone marrow, in either your humerus, femur or ribs. These blood cells have many responsibilities within the body. Red blood cells consist of haemoglobin, which carries oxygen around the body and to the muscles. White blood cells are a vital part of your immune system, detecting and dealing with infections. Each time you take a step, 200 muscles work in unison to lift your foot, propel it forward, and set it down. It's just one of the many thousands of tasks performed by the muscular system. This network of over 650 muscles covers the body and is the reason we can blink, smile, run, jump and stand upright. It's even responsible for the heart's dependable thump. First, what exactly is the muscular system? It's made up of three main muscle types. Skeletal muscle, which attaches via tendons to our bones. Cardiac muscle, which is only found in the heart. And smooth muscle, which lines the blood vessels and certain organs like the intestine and uterus. All three types are made up of muscle cells, also known as fibers, bundled tightly together. 
These bundles receive signals from the nervous system that contract the fibers, which in turn generates force and motion. This produces almost all the movements we make. Some of the only parts of the body whose motions aren't governed by the muscular system are sperm cells, the hair-like cilia in our airways, and certain white blood cells. Muscle contraction can be split into three main types. The first two, shortening muscle fibers and lengthening them, generate opposing forces. So the biceps will shorten while the triceps will lengthen or relax, pulling up the arm and making it bend at the elbow. This allows us to, say, pick up a book, or if the muscle relationship is reversed, put it down. This complementary partnership exists throughout the muscular system. The third type of contraction creates a stabilizing force. In these cases, the muscle fibers don't change in length, but instead keep the muscles rigid. This allows us to grip a mug of coffee or lean against a wall. It also maintains our posture by holding us upright. Skeletal muscles form the bulk of the muscular system, make up about 30 to 40% of the body's weight, and generate most of its motion. Some muscles are familiar to us, like the pectorals and the biceps. Others may be less so, like the buccinator, a muscle that attaches your cheek to your teeth, or the body's tiniest skeletal muscle, a one millimeter long tissue fragment called the stapedius that's nestled deep inside the ear. Wherever they occur, skeletal muscles are connected to the somatic nervous system, which gives us almost complete control over their movements. This muscle group also contains two types of muscle fibers to refine our motions even further, slow twitch and fast twitch. Fast twitch fibers react instantly when triggered, but quickly use up their energy and tire out. Slow twitch fibers, on the other hand, are endurance cells. They react and use energy slowly so they can work for longer periods. A sprinter will accumulate more fast twitch muscles in her legs through continuous practice, enabling her to quickly, if briefly, pick up the pace. Whereas back muscles contain more slow twitch muscles to maintain your posture all day. Unlike the skeletal muscles, the body's cardiac and smooth muscles are managed by the autonomic nervous system beyond our direct control. That makes your heart thump roughly three billion times over the course of your life which supplies the body with blood and oxygen. Autonomic control also contracts and relaxes smooth muscle in a rhythmic cycle. That pumps blood through the smooth internal walls of blood vessels, enables the intestine to constrict and push food through the digestive system, and allows the uterus to contract when a person is giving birth. As muscles work, they also use energy and produce an important byproduct, heat. In fact, muscle provides about 85% of your warmth, which the heart and blood vessels then spread evenly across the body via the blood. Without that, we couldn't maintain the temperature necessary for our survival. The muscular system may be largely invisible to us, but it leaves its mark on almost everything we do, whether it's the blink of an eye or a race to the finish line. Your circulatory system is absolutely fascinating and highly involved in this. In this short intro video of the circulatory system, we will mention some basics about its functions and trace the pathway of how blood travels through your heart. But please know before we get started, there are gigantic textbooks on the circulatory system itself. So obviously this video is just an intro. We're going to first talk about blood, the medium of how we transport glucose and gases. As we mentioned in our body systems intro video from many years ago, there are some misconceptions. Human blood is red, and always red, although the shade of red can vary based on how much oxygen is in the blood. Veins and arteries are often drawn in diagrams as blue or red to show whether they have lower or higher concentrations of oxygen, but that's just how it is used in most diagrams. It doesn't mean the blood or the veins or the arteries are actually that color. Veins that you see under your skin may look blue or green, but that involves the way they appear under the skin, and the reason for this would make a great physics topic, but I digress. Human blood has a lot of functions. It maintains a certain pH, temperature, osmotic pressure. All of this is very important for homeostasis. It transports things like hormones, nutrients, and gases and it's made up of different components. One component includes plasma, the liquid portion. Water, proteins, salts, lipids. 
you'll find them in this liquid portion of blood known as plasma. Another component includes cellular components. This means red blood cells, which do the transporting of gases, white blood cells, which can fight infections, and platelets, which are actually cellular fragments, and they're involved with helping your blood clot. Very important when there is damage to the body. Red blood cells have an iron-containing protein called hemoglobin, and that is where the red coloring of blood comes from. So when we're talking about blood and we're just introing the circulatory system, we're going to focus on how this blood moves around in the human body. Human heart anatomy observes the heart divided into two distinct and separated partitions, a deoxygenated or low oxygen partition and an oxygenated partition. There are some human congenital heart conditions that can result in this oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mixing, however. More on that at the end. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Think A for away. Arteries are typically oxygen rich, but there are exceptions. Veins generally carry blood to the heart. Veins typically are oxygen poor, but there are exceptions. Capillaries are small blood vessels and it is at the capillary level where oxygen is delivered to organs and tissues and where carbon dioxide will be picked up to travel back to the lungs. So looking at this heart, the right side, and that's the person's right, so for you it will look opposite, pumps deoxygenated blood, and the left side pumps oxygenated blood. We can also see four chambers, the right atrium and right ventricle, and the left atrium and the left ventricle. I like to remember that A comes before V in the alphabet, so that helps me remember that A's for atria are at the top of the heart, V for ventricles are at the bottom of the heart. Atria also have thinner walls than the thicker wall ventricles. The heart also contains valves, which we'll see when we get to tracing the pathway of blood. The valves are one-way structures that help separate the chambers and also prevent backflow of blood. Ready to take the adventure of a lifetime? An adventure tracing the pathway of blood through the heart? We're going to start with blood that is in a human toe. This blood is deoxygenated. It needs to get to the heart so that it can be pumped to the lungs to pick up oxygen and then be spread throughout the body. It's going to get there through the vena cava, inferior vena cava to be specific, as the superior vena cava is above the heart. The blood enters the right atrium. The right atrium contracts, pushing the blood through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The right ventricle contracts, pumping the blood through the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary artery. By the way, when you see the word pulmonary, it likely involves lungs. The pulmonary artery takes blood to the lungs. The lungs are where red blood cells in the blood will take on oxygen and release carbon dioxide. Now this blood is oxygenated. It needs to return to the heart so that the heart can pump it throughout the body. The oxygenated blood travels through a pulmonary vein to the left atrium. The left atrium contracts and the blood travels through the mitral valve also known as the bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle. The left ventricle contracts and pumps the blood through the aortic valve and out a major artery known as the aorta. The aorta is a major artery that carries oxygenated blood throughout the body. Now, I don't want to neglect the fact that the heart needs its own blood supply for delivery of oxygen and glucose. The heart can receive this blood supply through coronary arteries. Coronary arteries branch off the aorta and eventually deliver blood into capillaries. These capillaries deliver oxygen and glucose to the heart. Coronary veins will take the deoxygenated blood to the right atrium where the blood will eventually travel the pathway to become oxygenated. In fact, to quiz yourself, can you pause the video and trace the pathway of blood again starting with the right atrium? Okay, all together. Right atrium, tricuspid valve. Right ventricle, pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery, lungs, back through the pulmonary vein, left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, aortic valve, aorta. Takes it to the body and then it will eventually return through the vena cava back to the right atrium again. Whew, it almost makes you want to turn it into a song, but we won't. The significance of the pathways, how they interact, the coordination of contraction, and many more elements are part of every beat of your heart. 
A human heart beats over 100,000 times per day, so it's significant that every beat is coordinated and blood is directed where it should go. The complexity of the cardiac cycle, which is the coordinated sequence of the heart's contractions and relaxations, isn't something this short video can go into. Hopefully a separate video on that soon. One last thing. There are many conditions in which the heart doesn't function correctly. Anatomically, some heart conditions change the pathway flow of blood. One example that we had mentioned before is an atrial septal defect. The septum is the muscular wall that separates the right and left side of the heart. So a septal defect could mean an opening and oxygen-rich blood could mix with oxygen-poor blood. Depending on the size, this can cause further problems such as an abnormal heartbeat, stroke, or potentially heart failure in severe cases. Some medications can help the symptoms, or surgery can be an option. There continues to be more advancements for treating cardiovascular conditions. Across the whole planet, humans eat on average between 1 and 2.7 kilograms of food a day. That's over 365 kilograms a year per person, and more than 28,800 kilograms over the course of a lifetime and every last scrap makes its way through the digestive system. Comprised of 10 organs, covering 9 meters, and containing over 20 specialized cell types, this is one of the most diverse and complicated systems in the human body. Its parts continuously work in unison to fulfill a singular task, transforming the raw materials of your food into the nutrients and energy that keep you alive. Spanning the entire length of your torso, the digestive system has four main components. First, there's the gastrointestinal tract, a twisting channel that transports your food and has an internal surface area of between 30 and 40 square meters, enough to cover half a badminton court. Second, there's the pancreas, gallbladder, and liver, a trio of organs that break down food using an array of special juices. Third, the body's enzymes, hormones, nerves, and blood all work together to break down food, modulate the digestive process, and deliver its final products. Finally, there's the mesentery, a large stretch of tissue that supports and positions all your digestive organs in the abdomen, enabling them to do their jobs. The digestive process begins before food even hits your tongue. Anticipating a tasty morsel, glands in your mouth start to pump out saliva, we produce about 1.5 liters of this liquid each day. Once inside your mouth, chewing combines with the sloshing saliva to turn food into a moist lump called the bolus. Enzymes present in the saliva break down any starch. Then your food finds itself at the rim of a 25 centimeter long tube called the esophagus, down which it must plunge to reach the stomach. Nerves in the surrounding esophageal tissue sense the bolus's presence and trigger peristalsis, a series of defined muscular contractions. That propels the food into the stomach, where it's left at the mercy of the muscular stomach walls, which pound the bolus, breaking it into chunks. Hormones secreted by cells in the lining trigger the release of acids and enzyme-rich juices from the stomach wall that start to dissolve the food and break down its proteins. These hormones also alert the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder to produce digestive juices and transfer bile, a yellowish-green liquid that digests fat, in preparation for the next stage. After three hours inside the stomach, the once shapely bolus is now a frothy liquid called chyme, and it's ready to move into the small intestine. The liver sends bile to the gallbladder, which secretes it into the first portion of the small intestine, called the duodenum. Here, it dissolves the fats floating in the slurry of chyme so they can be easily digested by the pancreatic and intestinal juices that have leached onto the scene. These enzyme-rich juices break the fat molecules down into fatty acids and glycerol for easier absorption into the body. The enzymes also carry out the final deconstruction of proteins into amino acids and carbohydrates into glucose. This happens in the small intestine's lower regions, the jejunum and ileum, which are coated in millions of tiny projections called villi. These create a huge surface area to maximize molecule absorption and transference into the bloodstream. The blood takes them on the final leg of their journey to feed ileum, 
which are coated in millions of tiny projections called villi. These create a huge surface area to maximize molecule absorption and transference into the bloodstream. The blood takes them on the final leg of their journey to feed the body's organs and tissues. But it's not over quite yet. Leftover fiber, water, and dead cells sloughed off during digestion make it into the large intestine, also known as the colon. The body drains out most of the remaining fluid through the intestinal wall. What's left is a soft mass called stool. The colon squeezes this byproduct into a pouch called the rectum, where nerves sense it expanding and tell the body when it's time to expel the waste. The byproducts of digestion exit through the anus, and the food's long journey, typically lasting between 30 and 40 hours, is finally complete. So to define the nervous system in just one line, it's large and in charge. It's made up of billions of very, very, very special cells called neurons. And why are they really special? That's because they're not found anywhere else in the body. And these neurons bundle up together and form nerves. So information like, say, the glorious taste of cake travels super fast through the nerves to the brain and help the brain take important decisions like have more of that cake. Both you and I are wide awake, right? I'm assuming that you're awake now that you're listening to me. So here's something really interesting. We are individually producing enough electricity to power a small neon bulb. Now that's something you should you know, actually think about. Coming to what neurons look like. They look like typical cells. They have a cell body. They have a nucleus. But if you think about it, they look similar to a tree with the branches, the trunk and the roots. The branches are the dendrites, the trunk is called the axon and the roots are called the axon terminals. Terminal. Have you heard about the word terminal before? What happens in a train or a bus terminal? Trains or buses come in and go out, right? Similarly, at the axon terminals, information in the form of electrical impulses will pass from one neuron to the other. They actually high jump across from one neuron to the other through the small space called the synapse. The axons in some neurons are covered with a sheath. It's called a myelin sheath. And what the sheath does, it gives insulation to the neuron. And the myelin sheath has to be made up of cells. I mean, everything inside us is made up of cells, right? And these cells also get a name, Schwann cells. And there is a depression between two Schwann cells that you can see. It's called the node of Ranvier, named after the person who discovered it or found it, you know, for the first time. There are two main components or parts to the nervous system that you will actually learn about. One, it's called the central nervous system and everything else, which is the peripheral nervous system. So what is the central nervous system? You might have guessed it already. The main parts, the brain, the spinal cord, and they are responsible for something major. They are responsible for taking all decisions and thinking and telling the peripheral nervous system, you know, that is made up of nerves that branch all through the rest of our body, what needs to be done. And then the peripheral nervous system does it. So the nervous system uh, now, you know, is central to our existence. It makes us who we are. It makes us do what we do. Take a big breath in, hold it and breathe out. Now let's begin. You just use your respiratory system. It is a system in humans that is designed to extract oxygen from the air so we can use it in respiration around the body and at the same time get rid of carbon dioxide gas into the air which is the waste product from respiration. Let's follow a molecule of oxygen gas as it travels through the respiratory system. As you inhale, the molecule is drawn in through the mouth or the nose. It goes into the back of the throat where it enters a tube called the trachea. The trachea or windpipe has special rings of cartilage to keep it open at all times so you can breathe if you are lying down asleep or on a trampoline. 
The oxygen molecule now travels down the trachea and then will go into either the left or the right lung via a tube called the bronchus. This bronchus then splits into smaller tubes called bronchioles. And finally, the oxygen molecule will make its way into a tiny air sac called an alveolus. These alveoli are surrounded by tiny blood vessels called capillaries, and the oxygen molecule now passes across from the air into the blood via a process called diffusion. At the same time, a carbon dioxide molecule goes the other way, coming out of the blood and into the alveoli as you exhale. As you exhale, the carbon dioxide will take the journey back up the bronchioles, a bronchus, the trachea, and out of the mouth. This happens to millions of molecules with each breath, as you have about 300 million alveoli in each lung. On average, you breathe like this 12 to 16 times a minute. Why not count yours after this video? Unlike your digestive system, the respiratory system is a dead end. If something bad gets into your lungs, it's very hard to get it back out. As usual, the body has an answer to this. Look very closely at the cells lining the trachea and the bronchi. Some of them have tiny little hairs on them called cilia. And in between these cells are other cells called goblet cells that are secreting mucus. This mucus traps dirt, dust and bacteria before it enters the lungs. The cilia then waft this mucus up into the mouth where it can be swallowed to be killed by your stomach acid. There are many things that can go wrong with your lungs, such as asthma, pneumonia, and diseases associated with smoking, such as emphysema and chronic bronchitis. However, if you have a problem, a doctor may perform a bronchoscopy. This is when they put a tube with a light and a camera on it into your airways and look for signs of inflammation or bleeding. What exactly are hormones and how do they work? Hormones are tiny, single molecule messengers which take messages to other parts of the body when released into the bloodstream. They are produced and released by endocrine glands. The hypothalamus regulates body temperature, hunger, thirst, sleep, sex drive and moods, and it controls the release of hormones from other glands in the body. The pineal gland regulates sleep. The pituitary gland controls metabolism, growth, when you go through puberty, reproduction, blood pressure and much more. The thyroid produces hormones which regulate the body's metabolic rate, heart and digestive functions, muscle control, brain development and bone maintenance. The parathyroid regulates calcium levels in the body. The thymus produces T cells, which are a crucial part of the immune system. The pancreas produces the insulin that helps control blood sugar levels. The adrenal gland controls sex drive and produces cortisol, the stress hormone, and of course adrenaline. In women, the ovaries produce female sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone, and in men, the testes produce male sex hormones called androgens like testosterone. So really, hormones have a part in regulating almost every bodily process. The pituitary gland is often referred to as the master gland as it controls many of the others, and the pituitary gland takes orders from the hypothalamus, so these two are like the control center for the body. Let's look at how this works in a bit more detail. Have you ever felt an adrenaline rush? Maybe you've ridden a roller coaster and your heart was racing. Or perhaps you've been watching a scary film and a sudden noise makes you jump. This is the result of your brain thinking you're in danger and releasing hormones to prepare you for a fight or flight response. Firstly, the hypothalamus tells the pituitary gland about it, which in turn releases a chemical messenger into the bloodstream. The hypothalamus also sends a nerve signal down the spinal cord, which is quicker. Both the messages land at the adrenal gland, which reacts by producing adrenaline and sending it into the bloodstream. The adrenaline binds to different organs and produces many effects, including faster heart rate, heightened alertness, rapid breathing, widened pupils. This is just one of the many hormonal reactions that take place in the body but it shows us how the glands talk to each other, using hormones to relay messages that have real physical effects on the body. Humans have harnessed the power of hormones to their advantage. For example, many forms of birth control use estrogen and progesterone to affect a woman's menstrual cycle and stop the release of an egg, amongst other effects. This means a woman can take hormones to stop herself becoming pregnant when she doesn't want to. Someone with type 1 diabetes cannot produce the hormone insulin, which is usually produced in the pancreas, 
and therefore must inject it into their body in order to regulate blood sugar levels. Without this option, a type 1 diabetic would suffer from serious health problems. Oxytocin, known as the love hormone, is released when cuddling, being intimate with a partner, or even playing with a dog. Studies have shown that the hormone can reduce blood pressure, which reduces the risk of heart disease. It can also block stress hormones, help heal wounds, and even reduce swelling. The urinary system is also known as the renal system, and it consists of the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. Your kidneys are bean-shaped organs that are about the same size as a computer mouse. To find your kidneys, put your hands on your lower back and slide them up until you feel your ribs. Your kidneys are just behind a layer of muscle there. All your blood flows through your kidneys 400 times a day in order to filter out the waste. However, they also have other roles, as explained in the video, what is homeostasis? Keeping your body balanced is very important and the urinary system plays an important role in this. It keeps the water levels, ions such as potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium and phosphate, pH, and blood pressure as close to constant as possible. The blood goes into the kidneys via the renal arteries. It is then filtered into a million small filtering units called nephrons. Waste is then removed and flows down the ureters to the urinary bladder. The clean blood then leaves the kidneys via the renal veins and can return to the body. The liquid that collects in the bladder is called the urine. It contains urea, which is a waste product from the breakdown of the excess protein. It also contains excess water that the body doesn't need along with some ions like sodium and potassium. Did you know your bladder can hold up to 800 milliliters of urine? There are two little sphincters that control when to release the urine from the bladder. The first one opens up automatically when the bladder starts to get full. Luckily, we have voluntary control over the second one, so we can hold on that extra bit longer if we need. Sometimes, your kidneys can fail. A long-term complication associated with diabetes and blood pressure is kidney failure. This is obviously not good, as waste builds up in the blood very quickly. If this happens, you will need to go to hospital regularly and go on a dialysis machine. Dialysis does the same job as your kidneys, filtering the waste out of the blood and balancing water and ions. Hopefully, at some stage, you would be able to have a kidney transplant. The best thing about kidneys is that you actually only need one to function. So a healthy person can donate one of theirs to you, and you can both function normally. Magic. A mosquito lands on your arm, injects its chemicals into your skin, and begins to feed. You wouldn't even know it was there if not for the red lump that appears, accompanied by a telltale A mosquito lands on your arm, injects its chemicals into your skin, and begins to feed. You wouldn't even know it was there if not for the red lump that appears, accompanied by a telltale itch. It's a nuisance, but that bump is an important signal that you're protected by your immune system, your body's major safeguard against infection, illness, and disease. This system is a vast network of cells, tissues, and organs that coordinate your body's defenses against any threats to your health. Without it, you'd be exposed to billions of bacteria, viruses, and toxins that could make something as minor as a paper cut or a seasonal cold fatal. The immune system relies on millions of defensive white blood cells, also known as leukocytes, that originate in our bone marrow. These cells migrate into the bloodstream and the lymphatic system, a network of vessels which helps clear bodily toxins and waste. Our bodies are teeming with leukocytes. There are between 4,000 and 11,000 in every microliter of blood. As they move around, leukocytes work like security personnel, constantly screening the blood, tissues, and organs for suspicious signs. This system mainly relies on cues called antigens, these molecular traces on the surface of pathogens and other foreign substances betray the presence of invaders. As soon as the leukocytes detect them, it takes only minutes for the body's protective immune response to kick in. Threats to our bodies are hugely variable, so the immune response has to be equally adaptable. That means relying on many different types of leukocytes to tackle threats in different ways. 
Despite this diversity, we classify leukocytes in two main cellular groups, which coordinate a two-pronged attack. First, phagocytes trigger the immune response by sending macrophages and dendritic cells into the blood. As these circulate, they destroy any foreign cells they encounter simply by consuming them. That allows phagocytes to identify the antigen on the invaders they just ingested and transmit this information to the second major cell group orchestrating the defense, the lymphocytes. A group of lymphocyte cells called T cells go in search of infected body cells and swiftly kill them off. Meanwhile, B cells and helper T cells use the information gathered from the unique antigens to start producing special proteins called antibodies. This is the piece de resistance. Each antigen has a unique matching antibody that can latch onto it like a lock and key and destroy the invading cells. B cells can produce millions of these, which then cycle through the body and attack the invaders until the worst of the threat is neutralized. While all of this is going on, familiar symptoms like high temperatures and swelling are actually processes designed to aid the immune response. A warmer body makes it harder for bacteria and viruses to reproduce and spread because they're temperature sensitive. And when body cells are damaged, they release chemicals that make fluid leak into the surrounding tissues, causing swelling. That also attracts phagocytes, which consume the invaders and the damaged cells. Usually, an immune response will eradicate a threat within a few days. It won't always stop you from getting ill, but that's not its purpose. Its actual job is to stop a threat from escalating to dangerous levels inside your body. And through constant surveillance over time, the immune system provides another benefit. It helps us develop long-term immunity. When B and T cells identify antigens, they can use that information to recognize invaders in the future. So when a threat revisits, the cells can swiftly deploy the right antibodies to tackle it before it affects any more cells. That's how you can develop immunity to certain diseases, like chickenpox. It doesn't always work so well. Some people have autoimmune diseases, which trick the immune system into attacking the body's own perfectly healthy cells. No one knows exactly what causes them, but these disorders sabotage the immune system to varying degrees and underlie problems like arthritis, type 1 diabetes, and multiple sclerosis. For most individuals, however, a healthy immune system will successfully fight off an estimated 300 colds and innumerable other potential infections over the course of a lifetime. Without it, those threats would escalate into something far more dangerous. So the next time you catch a cold or scratch a mosquito bite, think of the immune system. We owe it our lives. Humans look a bit like each of their parents. This is because they share genetic information with both of them. This mixing comes about because of sexual reproduction, which involves the joining of two sex cells, or gametes, in the process called fertilization. You can find out more about fertilization by watching this video. Male and female humans have different reproductive systems. During puberty, the reproductive organs develop to enable the production of offspring. This video covers what happens during puberty in more detail. The testes produce sperm, the male gametes. The testes are kept outside the body in the scrotum. This keeps them cooler and is better to form sperm production. The sperm ducts carry sperm from the testes to the urethra, which is a tube running down the inside of the penis. Here the sperm is mixed with secretion from glands to produce a liquid called semen. Semen helps carry the sperm into the female reproductive system. Here is the female reproductive system. The female gametes, eggs or ova, are released from the ovaries. One is released every month by a process called ovulation. When a baby girl is born, she already has all of the eggs she will ever release inside her ovaries. During puberty, the monthly cycle of an egg maturing and being released starts. This is part of the menstrual cycle. More about this can be found in this video. After ovulation, the egg travels along a tube called the fallopian tube, or oviduct, away from the ovary and towards the uterus, which is also known as the womb. 
During sexual intercourse, also called copulation, semen is ejaculated from the penis into the woman's vagina and swim up through the cervix and uterus. If a sperm manages to reach the egg in the fallopian tube, then fertilization will occur. The egg only survives for 24 hours after ovulation, but sperm can survive for up to 5 days. This means that there is about 6 days during a cycle in which a sperm and egg can meet and the female can become pregnant. The fertilized egg, called a zygote, will start to divide. On reaching the uterus, this cluster of cells will settle into the lining. If the egg is not fertilized, it will leave the uterus along the lining and menstruation, also known as a period, will occur. Once inside the uterus, in a pregnant woman, the ball of cells will continue to divide and differentiate to form different types of cells. Some will form structures in the embryo and others the placenta. The placenta is an organ and is where the exchange of substance between the mother and embryo occurs. Nutrients and oxygen will pass from the mother's blood into the embryo's blood in the placenta. Blood vessels in the umbilical cord transport these to the embryo. Waste products like carbon dioxide will pass from the embryo to the mother where they are excreted. At the end of week 8 after fertilization, the embryo is called a fetus. Now it has all the organs including a heart and brain, but it is only still the size of a grape. The fetus continues to develop for the entire pregnancy, also called gestation, so it can survive independently of its mother. This is normally between 38 and 42 weeks. In this video you have learnt about sexual reproduction in humans and how the male and female sexual reproductive organs are used to form and grow a fetus, ready to be born. Your integumentary system contains the largest organ in your body, your skin. In fact, it makes up 16% of your overall weight. But why is your skin important? First, your skin protects you by keeping water in your body and nasty pathogens and germs out. Your skin keeps you in touch with your outside world. Nerve endings in your skin let you feel things around you. Your skin helps regulate your body temperature. Small organs in the skin called sweat glands make sweat. And as sweat evaporates, it cools your body. Skin helps get rid of waste and also it manufactures vitamin D. Skin comes in several colors because of a chemical called melanin. Melanin is important because it absorbs ultraviolet light from the sun. There are two main layers of your skin. First, your epidermis is the outermost layer of your skin. You see the epidermis when you look at your skin. Next, the dermis lies beneath the epidermis and then there is a fatty layer called the hypodermis which helps store energy because it's made up of fat. The epidermis is made of epithelial cells. Even though the epidermis has many layers of cells, it is only as thick as two sheets of paper. Next, the dermis lies beneath the epidermis and it has many different parts inside of it, such as blood vessels, which help transport substances, nerve fibers, which carry messages to and from your brain, hair follicles, muscle fibers, which are attached to a hair and help the hair stand up, oil glands, which help keep your skin flexible and waterproofs your epidermis and sweat glands which help cool you down. The layer beneath all this is called the hypodermis and like I said it is made up of fat and connective tissue. Your hair also, your skin also contains hair and nails. Hair helps protect your skin from ultraviolet light and it also helps keep particles such as dust and insect out of your eyes and nose. 
So there we go, our outside layer, the epidermis, which helps keep you alive. There are five main systems in the human body. Of this, the blank delivers carbon dioxide and waste materials to the excretory organs to be released from the body. What will be our um, key word here? That would be this one. It delivers carbon dioxide and waste materials. So, which part delivers carbon dioxide and waste materials to the excretory organs? It has to be carried in our blood, right? So, the answer here is letter C, our circulatory system.